Thanks so very much, Mark, for these kind words, and nice introduction, and also for uh, inviting me uh, here on this beautiful campus by this beautiful weather to, be with, to meet with uh, some old friends and some uh, new friends and to work together for uh, three days on the, the uh, most important topic of uh, the categories of uh, uh, religion and theology and the way they are used in, in the in Chinese world and East Asian world more generally and uh, in, the, in the Western world and their interactions. Um, I've presumably Mark invited me because I've, I've been working on this uh, question of the category of religion and uh, its uh, adaptation by uh, Chinese intellectuals and, and politicians by the late 19th and early 20th century and the effect of this uh, adaptation, this very creative adaptation. Uh, but maybe Mark was surprised when I came up with this topic for a keynote talk about bureaucracy and salvation. That's because in the meantime, I've been uh, switching back to uh, my uh, Taoist side and looking at uh, earlier historical material and the history of uh, Taoist uh, theology and ritual practices. But hopefully this will nonetheless uh, provide some uh, food for thought uh, during the, the workshop as what I'm going to talk about is one strand in uh, what we might call uh, native theology Shen uh, Xue, right, study about the gods, with an S. Uh, as we will see, there are a very large number of gods indeed involved in this uh, thread of thinking about uh, the status of the gods and how to attain this status. Now, when I told my colleagues back in Paris that I was uh, flying all the way to California to give a talk about bureaucracy and salvation, they sneered at me <laughs> because they, they thought that it was a metaphor for my escaping from my uh, administrative duties at the end of the graduate school <laughs> to have a good time <laughs> in the Bay Area. This is actually quite an apt metaphor, but it's also at the same time the title of a quite serious uh, book project that I am already under contract for. And so uh, this is the first time I present this project. It's a pretty over-ambitious project that I I'm expect quite a lot for, from your feedback, as it is quite tentative. Um, the, uh, one of the uh, departure points for this project is try to think about um, what Chinese people consider they become after, oops, after death, and uh, the uh, widespread frustration that is uh, either implicit or sometimes quite frankly expressed in the scholarship on these questions, because there has been a long-running uh, quest for a coherent system and a current understanding of uh, posthumous destinies in, the, in, the chi in Chinese culture. Uh, but scholars, whether scholars working on ancient periods or uh, medieval, early modern, or modern, or contemporary, have never been able to come up with one unified theory that would, ex theory that would explain all the different um, practices and beliefs that uh, are found both in the text and on the field. Um, one of the reasons for this uh, lack of a unified theory is that uh, there are different treatments applied to the body and the cells because there are different locations. Body in graves and cells and shrines in tablets in, uh, on altars, temples, or other places. One early theory, the San Juan Chipo theory, uh, that actually uh, gives human beings 10 cells that can have different destinies and can explain for these different treatments uh, is quite um, uh, well useful to explain <laughs> things, but it's less clear whether uh, it's actually a shared understanding of uh, human identity and its destiny after death, or just a scholarly attempt to make sense of a much more variegated uh, reality. Um, one very important early article on this topic uh, by Arthur Wolf 
famously explained that basically there are three kinds of uh, deceased humans, the gods, the ghosts, and ancestors, and probably everybody has been reading that and assigning that to her or his students, so I don't need to go over it again. Uh, but an important follow-up to that article uh, was published by Myron Cohen, um, who tried to reintroduce the question of salvation in this debate about uh, posthumous destinies and posthumous identities. And basically, this, this article is one of the uh, things that really got me thinking about the whole, this whole project on bureaucracy and salvation. Because uh, Cohen argues that salvation exists in a sort of a theory. It's mentioned in the rituals, and some, it's mentioned in the text, in the discourses. Uh, people talk about it. But actually, almost all of the ritual treatments of dead humans are done as if it did not exist. It was something that is uh, granted as a very remote possibility, but in, in practice, it's not dealt with. And uh, he, uh, one of the things he does in that important article is that he opposes, on the one hand, salvation, which is completely equates with re being reborn in the pure land. So he has a, a very um, like lay Buddhist understanding of what salvation is, and I'm going to uh, take issue with this in a, in a moment. Uh, but what he, what he says is that, on the one hand, we have salvation, which is um, controversial and uh, possibly... Um, uh, antinomial to uh, so the social order, and on the other hand, we have normal, socially accepted and state-supported state posthumous destinies like be becoming an ancestor or becoming a god. And uh, my whole, the whole point of this talk today is to uh, uh, deconstruct this opposition between salvation on the one hand and becoming a god on the other. Uh, so the, for the purpose of this uh, discussion, I. I just uh, sweep aside the whole question of defining Shen and defining God, because this uh, very complex <laughs> notion has a very long history, and that's not my topic, <laughs> because I'm only given 50 minutes. Um, so I just define it here as uh, a spirit or uh, uh, a spiritual being who is worshipped by and intervenes in the lives of non-kin. Right? So anybody can worship a God, a Shen, and a Shen can uh, grant blessings or, uh, um, on the other hand, punish uh, any human being, including people who are, who, who are not related uh, with him by uh, kin relationships. So uh, to uh, wrap up with this um, uh, model of uh, gods against ghosts, against ancestor, uh, and as it was also uh, uh, developed by, by Cohen, is my take is that this model explained very well ritual practices. I mean, uh, um, practices that ritual practices that communities have and their relationship to uh, various kinds of uh, deceased humans. But it does not explain individual religiosity. So my whole argument is that when we look at those things from the perspective of individual humans and how they imagine their own posthumous destiny, then we have a very different vision from uh, what we get by looking at uh, communal and family rituals. One of the hints I got that we might see things very differently from the gods, ghosts, and ancestors, and, and I'm not going to debunk that model. It's very useful for certain purposes. <coughs> but one of the hints I got that we might look at things a different way is uh, by, um, well, it, it came in the course of my work on morality books, especially revealed morality books, and especially one of the, uh, it's a rather recent, probably very early 19th century, well, turns of the 19th century, uh, revelation, but it's become very uh, rapidly a classic, and it, now it's all over the place. I've stopped collecting editions of the Yudi Bao Chao because I would need whole, uh, you know, buildings. Uh, they are, if you look it up, if you Google Yuli Bao Chao, you'll find billions of different websites that have their own edition of the Yuli Bao Chao with stories and illustrations and so on and so forth. It's a very important text to explain, uh, well, to, to look at, to study uh, modern Chinese religiosity. And it's about what people become after death, right? And it has a number of different options, of different possibilities. So first, uh, people be 
became what the text called a guilty souls gue fan. That's gue, of course, is not a ghost, right? <coughs> because a ghost is an atypical dead. A gue is a normal dead because everybody becomes a gue at first. Uh, and he is guilty because he has to uh, um, atone for uh, the, uh, the bad things uh, this person did in his life. And then after uh, judgment is passed, this person can be reincarnated as that's the normal path uh, for very, very uh, bad sinners. Uh, it can be punished uh, for eternity <coughs> or be annihilated. How you kill a ghost is an interesting notion. Uh, but then there are two more options and that's uh, what I'm mostly interested in. You can enter the otherworldly bureaucracy. You can just stay in hell you know, get a contract and work for the hell administration. And for, in some cases, you can also become a god. Uh, notably, those who have committed rightful suicide are described as becoming a Shen. Um, what is interesting, well, one of the things that are interesting in this list is that you don't find ancestors. There is not a single mention. It's, Yuli Baosho is a pretty long text. You don't find one single mention of ancestors and ancestor worship. Right? So, so much for Chinese culture being mostly about ancestors and, uh, and ancestor worship. Not the case in this extremely important and widespread text. And it's not a Buddhist text, right? As of course, it's full of Buddhist vocabulary. Uh, but it's really a San Jiao kind of um, comprehensive description of popular theology. And also, uh, no mention of the pure land. So the most uh, desirable outcomes of the various uh, bureaucratic processes described in this text are becoming a god or being re reincarnated in a high uh, social position. So the fact that this text does not mention pure land and does not mention ancestors got me thinking about how does this text express what people want or fear for themselves? Because uh, this text is not about ritual practices. Well, it does mention ritual practices, but it's not mainly about prescribing what communities and families should do. It's about individual destinies, right? Um, and from this text and from many other texts, and uh, pushing back in time, we realize that people, of course, are afraid of being a gui for too long. We are going to be gui, that's for sure, but uh, the shorter the process, the better. Um, ancestorship is not so desirable because it, not, it does not last forever. These ancestors dissolve into uh, like a generic group after a few generations. I, uh, it might sound anachronistic, I'm ju jumping from Yuli Baochao to the Zhojuan, but I just love this uh, quote too much. <laughs> So I can't help using it, right? Sing with that and log with you right? The, uh, the, the, new, the newly dead are strong and big, and the old dead have become small, right? So you, you, cannot stay, you can stay an ancestor forever, except that you shrink and you eventually dissolve. And that's not a very appealing uh, perspective for uh, many people, apparently. Reincarnation also raises... Uh, all kinds of problems in terms of maintaining your identity, staying who you are with your name and your history. And uh, salvation, uh, whether it's uh, in, the, in this Buddhist guise of attaining pure, the pure land or in this Taoist mode of attaining immortality is desirable but difficult to achieve, right? So um, becoming a god appears in that picture as a very, fascinating uh, and attractive possibility because it allows one to maintain his or her identity. Right? A god has a history, a god does not change name. Right? Even thousands of years after this person has died, his or her birthday is still celebrated on the very day he is supposed to have been born. And you have uh, days, days as well, and days when one attained the Tao and, and so on and so forth. But the, the point is that you maintain your name, you maintain your specific identity forever. And that's the only uh, of the uh, several uh, 
existing posthumous destinies that allows one to maintain his or her identity. And that's the main reason, I think, for the desire for divinity, for divine status that has been existing in Chinese culture for a long time and for which I I'm, I'm, will try uh, today to give like a short history, short long-term history. Uh, I like this quote about Jiang Zouan because it's important <coughs> for different reasons. Jiang Zouan was a lowly uh, official of the, the Nanjing area in the, uh, the third century CE, and uh, apparently not a very reputable person, and he died in a fight with local bandits. Uh, and is, as far as we know, the uh, earliest Shen, I mean, the god who has been um, recognized by the Chinese state, given a title, being be canonized by the Chinese state after he died and after local people uh, started to uh, worship him and build a temple for him. That, of course, this kind of process, um, the person appearing through spirit mediums, uh, requiring uh, sacrifices and a temple being built, that's become a standard feature of Chinese society over the centuries. And, uh, and the Chinese state intervening in granting titles for that divinity. Uh, but that's apparently the, f the first, well, the earliest recorded instance that we have. And it's also the earliest example I have found, that might have been earlier, but that's the earliest I know of this expression uh, which is quoted here from the, the fourth century, uh, mm -hmm. so written just maybe one century after the facts, but it's quoted from the much later, Taiping Guangji. Uh, it's the first uh, occurrence of <coughs> that expression, Zedong Wei Shen, that is, after I die, I will become a god. That's what he says when he's still alive. Of course, that's a reconstruction, that's a story, but it's the first story, the earliest story we find where a living person says, I want to become a god when I die. And he manages, right? Through blackmailing, of course, he's not a very reputable person, but that, that's <laughs> not the point. He does attain his goal and he becomes a god. And this expression, the way Shen, to get to become a god, becomes more and more common uh, in the course of Chinese history and by the song, and I'm going to uh, uh, talk uh, more about the Song period in a moment. That's all over the place in, in uh, liturgical texts, but also stories, novels, <coughs> theater, and so on and so forth. And th that's also one of my threads through this project, the way Shen, to get to become a god. How do you, how do you get to become a god? Um, so uh, how do you, you get to become a god? That's something that evolves through history and um, my take on it is that the possibilities keep expanding through times, especially through uh, periods of change where uh, both theological and social and ritual practices change in such a way to, as to open new possibilities for human beings to become gods. Um, so very briefly, and of course when I'm talking about antiquity, I'm a little uh, far from my basis, so uh, please pardon me if I'm being uh, uh, a little uh, confused about certain aspects. But what I see is that um, we, we find human beings becoming ancestors in the earliest documents, of course, that's very well known, the uh, Shang uh, uh, divination documents, and the... Uh, the way people, that people become ancestors is linked to their social status when they were alive. We see by the Zhou, uh, they had humans, uh, heroes like the Yellow Emperor, but that's uh, not, uh, it's something that's not uh, open to uh, most human peoples, right? It's only uh, dynastic founders and people from uh, heroes from uh, high antiquity. Uh, during that time, the uh, ordinary uh, humans become Gui, and uh, the status of the Gui evolves through the uh, 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 spring out autumn periods and, and the warring states period from just dead people <coughs> who happen to live somewhere under the earth to uh, peoples being 
punished, being uh, subjected to all kinds of uh, uh, very unpleasant treatments by an otherworldly administration that we see appearing by the uh, fifth, fourth century BC and expanding rapidly and nonstop uh, from that point on with the inventions of health, health I mean, uh, um, punishments, torture, and so on and so forth, and the attendant um, rise of the feeling that has been famously described by a number of scholars, including uh, uh, Steve Bokenkamp, as anxiety for the dead. I mean, this feeling that uh, people used to be able to rely on their dead kin for support and blessings, and now they are mostly um, worried about both the, uh, the suffering that the ancestors were undercoming uh, in the land of the Gwe, and the fact that these sufferings might reflect back on them through uh, uh, the Jongsong, the uh, also worldly lawsuits, and uh, other ways that the dead had to uh, pass on their suffering onto the living. And the, uh, the cultural responses that arise to uh, meet with this anxiety for the dead take various forms, uh, mostly the idea of transcendence, that some humans might escape this and become transcendent. It's not affected by uh, the operation of the world, in including the, the courts of hell. Uh, reincarnation, of course, uh, broadened by Buddhism, and uh, divinization, the access to the, uh, the, the divine status. During the, uh, the Warring States period, we see two major innovations that uh, change this landscape of the dead, as it were. The first is that um, by the, uh, uh, maybe uh, as early as the fifth <coughs> century BC, we see that dead officials continuing to be officials in the other world, mostly in the administration of the dead, for which there are several versions, the two main ones being uh, the administration of the, uh, of the Taishan by the Eastern Peak, and the other one being Fengdu. And there are all kind of texts that link those two and explain why there are two places for the dead, and actually one being the uh, one uh, appendix of, of the other. Uh, but the main thing here is that we see a, that the judiciarization of the other world, the fact that punishment and torture need to play by the rules, so they, they need rules and they need people to apply those rules to the dead, and this newly appeared function is filled by, well, most naturally by people who know how to run an administration that's the, the official of this world. And this, the uh, second and uh, uh, quite opposite uh, innovation of that period is that we see by the fourth century BC um, the uh, possibility of uh, ac um, accessing to transcendence, to escaping the vagaries of the world, whether it's the world of the living or the world of the dead, and to access immortality. And during the first stage of a discourse on transcendence, it's mostly against the other worldly bureaucracy. And in some cases, it's quite explicitly against it. I mean, there are some manuals explaining how to become an immortal that basically tell, tell you how to cheat the other worldly bureaucracy, how to deceive them, how to make them think that they've caught you when actually they have caught somebody else, who is, of course, the loser in the, in the game, but... <laughs> As long as you get immortality, then that's worth the trick. And uh, this idea that, uh, that we have during that period, that we have on the one hand people who, who, go, who rise to heaven and become immortals, and on the other hand, people who go down below the hearth and become officials of the dead, um, these are just two uh, completely opposite ways. But that's just a f uh, one stage in the history of divinization. And from that point on, these two different ways will become closer and closer to each other, I will as I will try to show. Um, and of course, uh, and <coughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I'm again jumping over centuries here, but I just wanted to mention again that this uh, first 
way to ac uh, accessing transcendence that's uh, imagined by uh, the fourth century, which is immortality, um, becomes much later, about the fifth or sixth uh, century. Uh, it, it's still there, right, all along uh, the, the course of Chinese history to the, up to the present day. But by the fifth or sixth century of the Common Era, uh, pure Buddhism becomes a much more widely um, advertised and practiced way of ac accessing transcendence. So um, after this first uh, moment of uh, this first watershed of thinking about death and the souls of humans, I would like to, to again briefly mention another key moment, which is the, uh, the advent of the uh, heavenly master uh, Taoism, Tian Shi Dao, by uh, the second century uh, of the common era, by the late uh, Han period. Um, there are many aspects to the, uh, the change that the Tian Shi Dao brought to the Chinese religious scene, and I'm not going to mention them all, of course, but one uh, key aspect for my purpose today is that everybody in the Tian Shi Dao movement was ordained, that is, received <coughs> the register, ordination register, Lu. And Lu, of course, was originally a list of tax-paying people that the Lord received when he, was, uh, when he, when he received a, a, a fief or a kingdom or, or a piece of land. Um, but now the Lu in, the, in, the, the, in Taoism is not a list of living people that works for you. It, it's a list of dead people that work for you. But the idea is the same. They are enrolled in your service. And there is a whole gamut of ordination registers, and they are keep being, new ones keep being invented uh, 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 since then and, and, and still today. Uh, so starting from the very basic children's Lu, Tongzi Lu, which just give you the names and appearance so you can visualize, visualize them. And that's why, and that's just an extract for the modern, from a modern ordination register with the, uh, the pictures of all the, the successive uh, heavenly masters, the Zhang Tianshu, right? Um, but the uh, registers uh, give you the names and also the appearance. So sometimes it's a drawing or painting, sometimes it's just uh, uh, descriptions in words, but in all cases, it gives you <coughs> control over these spirits so you can summon them and have them at your service and, and command them, right? Um, and for the very high-ranking uh, registers, that also includes celestial gods. But from the, for the basic uh, ordination registers, these are mostly souls of the dead, right? They are put at your service. And the whole point is that once you are ordained, even there is a very ba at a very basic level, um, the Tongzhu is normally given at age seven, right? So they are child and have just given the name and appearance of a few uh, spirits that, that they can call. But even that very preliminary ordination gives you a title and a rank in the, uh, in the divine bureaucracy. And that grants you uh, immunity from the, uh, the courts of hell. And there are lots of stories you can find all the way from, from the, uh, this uh, early uh, medieval period down to the present day where people who have received ordination registers, even very preliminary ones, because uh, high-ranking registers allow you to become a priest and to do rituals, right? But very basic preliminary registers don't give you any capacity to do a ritual, to, you know, given to children or young people. But they nonetheless give you a, a shenzhi, a title and a rank in the divine bureaucracy. And as a such, since you have become a god, the uh, minions of hell cannot come and catch you. And that's one major answer to the uh, anxiety we were uh, uh, talking about just a moment ago. Right? How to escape as the, the world of the dead becomes more and more frightening. How do you escape them? And one answer is through ordination, because now you have a position just as in the uh, real world, I don't like this term, but the, uh, the gentry right, in imp imperial China could not be tortured. And that was one of the uh, very uh, <coughs> real benefits of having studied and passing at least the first uh, stage of the public uh, uh, civil service examination is that you are a shensha, you are a member of the gentry, so that officials cannot come and torture you. 
as they can for ordinary people, as is well known. Um, and, and for the very same reason, people ordained, if they have a shenzhi, right, a divine rank and title, they cannot be tortured in hell. Um, so that's one answer, but there's something even more interesting in that history of uh, ordination and, and the Lu is that the spirits of the dead, the souls of the dead, that are listed in the Lu and given to the person being ordained, share his destiny now, and they share the, uh, his status. So they also escape from the courts of hell. Right? And each time someone who has been ordained does a good thing. For Taoist priests, basically, he says, at the, time of, uh, at the end of a ritual, at, at the end of any Taoist ritual, there is this small section that many people don't pay attention to, which, which is crucial, which is called yang gong, to tell the merits, to say the merits. Basically, it says, we have done this ritual to ask for rain for the people who are suffering because the, uh, the land is dry, or asking the gods to bring healing to that person who is sick, and, and so on and so forth. We have done the ritual properly, so we have gained merit. We have done something good. And so we need, as a consequence, to be promoted. So the, the living person, the Taoist, who has done the ritual, is being promoted, like one rank up. But he also lists all the spirits that have helped him do so, including all the spirits in his loo. And they are also promoted. And when you read hagiographies in the Taoist literature, and there are quite a lot of hagiographies in the Daozong and, and outside of the Daozong as well, it's always, and it's sometimes it's quite repetitive. And Mark Mullenbelt recently, in his nice book on the Function Yeni, has shown that it's the same thing for many novels, including the Function Yeni, is that the structure of these stories is very rep repetitive. People do something good, they do a ritual, they do a miracle, they, they do something. And then they get promoted. And you have a list of everybody being promoted, including and actually mostly all the spirits and the gods and, and the dead, the souls of the dead, who have taken part in the, in the, in the process. <coughs> right. So by giving the souls of the dead, by enlisting them into registers and giving them to human beings, the Tian Shi Dao promoted the, uh, all those dead people into the ranks of the divine bureaucracy and allowed them to escape uh, the, uh, the punishment and tortures in the courts of the other world. Another important innovation that the Tian Shi Dao brought and that the other Taoist uh, revelation that followed uh, on the heels of the Tian Shi Dao and that keep being appearing because you know Taoism has new revelation. Like if we're weak, <laughs> it's it's an open revelation. But the, the major uh, revelation of the uh, early medieval period, like the Shangxing and Lingbao, built on that foundation that the Tian Shi Dao had uh, established and further uh, elaborated its uh, theology. And one major innovation is that the um, high-level um, adepts who have directly accessed Transcendents who have become immortals or Zhenzhen, true personal transcendents, as they are called in the Shangqing and later text, they are integrated into a bureaucracy. They become immortal officials, Xian Guan. And I think that's important because before that, there were lots of immortals. Right? We have um, Ye Xian Zhuan and that kind of stories about the immortals and the cults of the immortals. They are all over the place in, in, in Han and early medieval China but they are very independent. Now the immortals are brought together. Uh, they're not allowed to be freelancers anymore. They are brought into a bureaucracy and they are given ranks and titles. And this clearly stand over. They are in much higher in the hierarchy than the, uh, the, uh, the bureaucracy of the dead, right? which are called <coughs> Gui Guan, dead officials. But the two walls are not completely separated, and you can be promoted from the one to the other, which means that basically you can, even if you don't practice if, if your life, if you practice if your life and you access transcendence directly, of course, that's the best course. Right? It's, the, it's the quick way, <laughs> and it's the sure way, but it's quite difficult. But if you don't practice in your life, but manage somehow to get even a very low um, ranking 
um, function as uh, a Greek one, as an official in the other world, managing the dead and, and so on and so forth. And if you play by the rules, if you're reliable, if you do your work properly, then you can move up the hierarchy. It takes time, but you, you are promised, and, and the Taoist texts say that very explicitly, you have the possibilities of uh, going up to becoming an immortal official. That is, you, you can become immortal after you die, which is a quite interesting notion when you think of it. Um, so the, this whole system is based on meritocracy rather than the aristocratic system. Because but at the same time, and, and, and very often the very same Taoist texts, like the texts like the Zheng Gao, tell us about uh, there's aristocratic families who have become by that time obsessed about the precise rank and title of their dead kin in the other world. Because they're, of course, competing with each other. But they clearly have the notion that because they, and it's a, it's a no notion that we already find in the warring states period, that only big families who have rank and title and social status in this world can access similar <coughs> titles and, and, and ranks in the other world. And we see those families asking the Taoists about, okay, and no grandpa, which rank is he exactly now? And, and they are, of course, telling good stories about their ancestors and, and bad stories about the ancestors of the other families. And the Taoists try to change the whole system by introducing the idea of meritocracy that you can start very low, but work your way up. OK, now, uh, again, jumping over six or seven centuries, <laughs> arriving and, and, and moving closer to my own basis, uh, arriving at what I see as the third <coughs> uh, key moment in that very long durée history of divinization practices in Chinese history, and that's uh, what I like to call the song modernity. There's a whole debate about, you know, Tang Song transition, and it is, is really this Tang Song transition such a clear-cut, uh, complete transition from one world, one medieval world, to a modern world, or is it because we have uh, printing and books by the song that we don't have for the Tang, that we s consider that song brings all kinds of novelties that actually existed before but were not documented? Uh, I'm not going to go into that debate, even though I, I do tend to lean on the uh, um, uh, rupture rather than continuity side in this uh, you know, Tang Song thing and, and consider that uh, Chinese society as we know it was actually born in the 10th and 11th century. Uh, okay, don't quote me <laughs> <laughs> saying that, please. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> but, okay, that, that's the um, kind of uh, framework. Uh, in which I, I uh, read uh, quite a number of 10th uh, uh, century and early song texts about all of those things. Um, one element, of course, is a transition from, and that, that's another big uh, scholarly debate that I'm not going to delve uh, into, uh, but there's the idea that Tang was still basically an aristocratic society and the Tang officials were all, all from the aristocratic families and that the opening up of the examination system during the Song um, was at least on a rhetorical level or ideological level, if not on a very like, social practical level, opening the uh, bureaucracy to the whole of society. Uh, in any case, um, whatever the reality of the social base of the uh, uh, imperial bureaucracy, becoming more uh, I mean, larger, more uh, <laughs> inclusive, we, we do have, in many ways, a new stage in the bureaucratization of society. And that has a very direct impact on the way Chinese society uh, manages its uh, debt. Because as much as it wants the Song state, and again, I'm, I'm just eating at, at hinting at this now, but uh, many of those uh, changes that we tend to call song actually find their roots in the 10th century, which is uh, usually described as a very chaotic period, but it's also an extremely creative period in, in, in many ways. Um, 
So as much as the uh, some of the uh, pre-song states and certainly the song states tried to include uh, society within its uh, its governance and its uh, administrative <coughs> system, it's also tried to include the dead within one larger system rather than just giving uh, uh, recognition uh, to the ancestors of the aristocratic families and, and, and leaving all the, uh, the dead from the commoners' families uh, in a sort of a, a no man's land. And this process of including the uh, ordinary dead into a, a, a bureaucratic and state control system uh, was based on, on one, this key notion of junction that's correct God or orthodox. Orthodox is not a very good translation for Zheng in many contexts. And here, actually, the, uh, maybe the, the better translation for Zheng is state sanctions or recognized, which a term which we first, I think we first find used in the, in the Taoist medieval text and becomes an, an official I mean, term that's all over the official literature by the song. And behind this notion of Zheng Shen, we have the idea that all the dead are potentially eligible to being recognized, to being given a title and a recognition by the state. And there is a process of nomination that's f been famously studied by uh, Valerie Anson and, and other scholars, uh, with very standardized uh, procedures for recognizing uh, the, uh, the souls of the dead and giving them titles and a right to be worshipped. <coughs> and the Taoist institution played a major part in that process, and that's also the moment by the 19th, uh, 10th century when the institution of the, the Zhang Everly Master in Long uh, is uh, emerges and comes to play uh, a, a major role as a kind of Taoist bureaucracy, being itself part of the imperial state and managing uh, titles for the living and for the dead, giving ordination to the living and, and giving canonization titles for the dead. That does not exist before the uh, 19th century, but it, it, it becomes uh, um, an important part of the, uh, the uh, Song and then later Yuan, Ming, and Qing governance of the, uh, of the religious landscape and of the, uh, of the, of the spirits. Um, one other related aspect of this uh, Song revolution is the appearance of a corpus of low codes for the dead usually called Tian Lu, right, Heavenly Code, or Gui Lu, Codes for the Dead, and the two terms are very often uh, inter interchangeable. Uh, you're going to find the same things using both. Um, these are extremely interesting texts, not entirely new, uh, because we have in the early uh, Tian Shida, we already have a text called uh, <coughs> Nu Qing Gui Lu, but it's, it's, we, are, we don't have a complete version of it anymore. Um, so we have precedence. But by the song, we have all the new uh, ritual <coughs> movements of the uh, 10th uh, century and the Song, called the Dao Fa, right, Taoist rituals. Um, movements like Tian Xin Zheng Fa, Shen Xiao, Qing Wei, etc. There are thousands of them. Uh, they all compile their own codes. And why do they do that? It's because these movements are mostly exorcistic. They deal with the un unruly dead. And in order to do that, they count the, uh, the, 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 um, the ritualist, the, the priest, can't be, um, they can't act out of whim, right? They are considered by society efficacious and legitimate in uh, uh, catching demons and closing temples and, and, and more generally managing the world of the spirits and the dead because they just apply known rules. And so these, these movements do publish these rules. And these rules are very interesting, very fascinating text to read, because they explain in great detail what the dead can do and can't do. And they say in no uncertain terms that if they abide by the codes, the dead can be promoted all the way to becoming major gods. But if at any point of their career, <coughs> they lapse. They don't obey the rules. It is a very constraining system, right? They cannot do anything without authorization for their, from their higher ups. If they um, break the rules, then they, they will be demoted, and in some cases, punished. Though there is, in, in those codes, there is the uh, very clear promise 
for never-ending promotion into the uh, MPRNs, but on the conditions that all, the, all of them done from the, uh, uh, the, the lowly clerks in the uh, running the civil bureaucracy all the way to the high gods managing the destinies of the, of the living. They, if, they, if they don't abide by the rules, they will be uh, expelled from this uh, promos process of uh, continuous promotion. So um, these codes, they give to uh, the souls of the dead uh, rights and duties. They give them a very important right, which is to be worshipped and to eat sacrifices. And this is a key theme in the text of this period. Because in the earlier periods, the soul of the dead were enlisted and rolled into the ordination register. They had the uh, benefit of escaping the courts of hell, but they could not be worshipped. They could just act as clerks or runners for the Taoists. They could not be worshipped by others, and they could not receive sacrifice, especially meat. And of course, the question of the blood sacrifice is absolutely key in that story, because by, during the whole course of the first millennia, both the Taoists and the Buddhists have tried to convince the gods to stop eating meat, and they have failed. Right. So now, by this uh, song, uh, Ajunamento, as it were, the spirits of the souls who work for the Tao, who work for, in, in, in uh, cooperation with the priest, they receive the right to eat meat, so to receive sacrifice. This is admitted. And so they can have their own temples. And this is even better than just being enlisted in an ordination <coughs> register. You can have your own temple. You can eat meat. Right. On the condition that you obey the, uh, um, the rules and you're not like giving blessings or uh, meting out punishments to the people in your temple community out of whim. Right. If you do that, you will be deprived of temple and sacrifices and title and rank and benefits. Right. So you have to uh, 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 apply the rules and to uh, keep uh, fighting against those Xieshen, that's the spirits, the souls that, uh, of the dead, who, are not into the, who don't buy into the system, right? who don't apply the rules. And so in this uh, well, revolution, the word might be a bit strong, but I think it, it, it does give an idea of this uh, sea change of um, the relationship between the living and the souls of the dead in terms of give, uh, offering them sacrifices and giving them uh, uh, ranks and titles. Because now most of the, um, uh, the souls of the dead are uh, considered as becoming junction and displaying by the rules, there is a feeling of trust that builds around them. We does not mean that everybody thinks that all the gods always do the right thing. They might be corrupted, and that's why the code is for, but to, to punish such uh, uh, errant uh, behavior. But the idea is that, as a rule, the, the gods can be trusted. And this is in quite a stark contrast to early medieval texts about the gods, when we see them as very fickle and unreliable. And uh, also the, the demons that meet out uh, epidemics and, and uh, you know, um, all kinds of uh, disasters be tend to uh, drift from the status of uh, demons to being mere odorlings of a uh, divine bureaucracy that uh, meet out punishment because itself it plays by the rules and it applies the code and it sends punishments to people who have deserved this punishment. Um, Okay, another, yet another aspect of this uh, evolution or revolution during the song is that we have a new pantheon that is designed precisely in order to accommodate all these new gods, these new spirits who are now access to uh, ranks and titles <coughs> in the divine bureaucracy. Um, so I'm going to go very quickly, quickly over that. But uh, one major element is the, uh, the rise of the Jade Emperor, Yuhuang Shangdi, 
What does not exist? Actually, the term exists in earlier uh, texts, mostly Taoist texts, but not with that uh, connotation of the highest ranking god among those uh, uh, among the uh, the Hotian. That's excluding the very uh, pure de astral deities that are in a separate realm. All the other gods that have been once you, uh, living humans, and then who have died, and then who have been promoted as gods, have the uh, Jade Emperor as their supreme uh, authority. And uh, the Yuhuang, <coughs> Yuhuang Shangdi, which is really an a early song theological innovation, uh, is also merged with the uh, imperial cult. That's the heaven of the imperial sacrifices, the Haotian. So we have the uh, Taoist pantheon and the Taoist pantheon who uh, come very, uh, not exactly merged, but c come uh, very close together by the, uh, the Song period. And below uh, the, the Jade Emperor, we have a rise of a whole new territorial divine bureaucracy. Um, of course, they were Earth God before, but now they are considered, and they are very long, usually the longest section in the Tianlu, in the divine codes of that period, explaining the, the duties and, uh, and the process of promotion for the earth, earth god. And above the earth god, we have the city gods, four counties, Sien, right? And that's also uh, a, a new development. There were a couple of city gods here and there during the Tang, but not systematic at all. By the Song period, in any Taoist ritual and, and, and many uh, popular ritual, you cannot address the god without going through the city god. So it's the whole territorial bureaucracy that's, you know, like a greed encompassing everybody on the, uh, in the empire that is um, imposed on this, uh, uh, <clears throat> well, imposed as, as a system for managing the gods. And, um, and the city gods are considered as pretty high ranking gods, and, and the uh, and the whole literature emerged around that time about who, who are the city gods. And usually they are f famous uh, uh, dead officials of uh, earlier times. And the one person who is considered in charge of nominating these uh, 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 dead people as city gods is the, the Zhong Heavenly Master. So the uh, head of the, uh, the Taoist uh, system for uh, promoting uh, the souls of the dead. Um, at the same time, uh, the bureaucracy gets, the bureaucratic system of the uh, other world get clarified uh, because there were, in earlier times, there were some uh, confusion between uh, what I call the feudal title, which are actually honorary titles and actual bureaucratic hosting, the shenzhi, which involved a, a precise function that has to be filled, a, a, a precise assignment, right? Well, this is just honorary. So the, the whole uh, um, bureaucratic system gets uh, clarified and expanded at the same time. And also a clear division, which was not really present before, well, not to that degree, between the civil positions and the military positions. And we find many stories about um, humans who uh, very often are in the military or in any case, have not received a formal uh, literary education. And so we cannot be promoted as civil officials, right, like clerks or judges. And they get to uh, access the ranks in the uh, divine bureaucracy through uh, exorcistic functions in, uh, in military positions, right, as a general and the uh, uh, higher ranking uh, marshals. And we have lots of the, um, actually the most common uh, title given to uh, uh, dead souls being uh, uh, worshipped during the Song period is General Jiang Jun. Right? Because they are considered as uh, having <coughs> uh, a function in that uh, exorcistic uh, uh, police-like uh, branch of the, uh, of the divine administration. So uh, to sum it up, by the song, was when we witnessed this uh, very uh, rapid and uh, spectacular expansion of the divine bureaucracy, we find a whole 
question of who are the gods uh, being addressed in a rather different way than uh, during the earlier periods. Of course, we still have, as has been the case for very long, victims of bad deaths, uh, people who have committed suicide or who have self-sacrificed themselves for the, for the benefit of the local community who are promoted as gods. And that has been the case for very long, and it's still the case today. And it's still a major uh, well, a way of access into uh, <clears throat> the status of the gods. But this is not exclusively the case, because now <coughs> we have um, officials who become local gods, especially city gods, without going through that kind of uh, bad death, and uh, who are also at the same time who do benefit from uh, ancestor worship. Because the, the wolf model, right, gods, ghosts, ancestors, has it that you cannot be a god or an ancestor. If you have a normal death, then you have, uh, the, your family has turned you into an ancestor and you cannot become a god. But actually, this is not the case. For many of those uh, uh, officials of the Song uh, period and, and all the way to the, uh, uh, to the 20th century, they do consider, and you find that all over the, uh, the literature, people say, well, in, uh, officials, scholars, that I've been trained as a scholar, I have this competence, after, my, after I die, I will continue to do that, and I will be a city god. That's uh, for many, of, most of them, it's absolutely obvious, it's, it's self-evident, right? And so for this reason, they argue about the identity and the history of the local gods. And that's the song period is also the, the moment when we see, and there are some precedents to that, but it's, it's, it becomes overwhelmed by the song. We see local uh, officials or local scholars rewriting the geographies of the local gods and say, no, no, he's not that you know, serpent or he's not that uh, young woman who committed suicide. No, 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 he was a young, brilliant young scholar. And, you know, his local community revered him, so they built his temple for him. But then some spirit mediums got it wrong and invented this story of a suicide. Of course, this is a reinventing. Many of those cults actually started as worship of uh, local demons and, and, and suicides. But at the same time, this rewriting of the history of the gods by the officials, it, it's not just pure uh, aversion towards local uh, religious culture. It's also based on the fact that they also want to become God, and they want to, people to accept the fact that not all gods are those disreputable, very strong, uh, fierce, uh, very lean, but also very uh, uh, immoral spirits. And uh, of course, this uh, uh, buys into the, uh, the very old a dialectic bit uh, about the gods and the, uh, the the question of whether they are mostly you know very powerful linked by themselves or they are promoted uh, to uh, <clears throat> status to godly status because they are moral examples right so the, the the two actually exist but it's very interesting to see how uh, scholars and officials try to make it ac to uh, to make people accept and, uh, and people do accept the idea that you can become a god without going through this abnormal um, uh, ways of dying. So as they do that, the idea that most people can become god, um, and it's actually a, a normal uh, posthumous destiny for people to become a god, becomes widely accepted by the song and, and, and stays so up to the, uh, to the modern period. Now, how, if it's desirable and possible to become a god, how do people become gods? Um, there are, of course, several ways. You can uh, be promoted to be a god after death. That's divinization by others. And uh, first uh, of... of uh, the ways into, uh, in which people can turn their dead kin into gods, of course, is the salvation ritual during the funeral, right? the, 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 the chao du. And both the Buddhist and the Taoist funeral actually turn people into god because they gave them uh, 
posthumous ordination, either through the loo, which I mentioned before, or through the, the GA, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, taking of vows or precepts, the GA, right? And uh, in, uh, in China, but it's also the, the famously the case in Japan with the, the, the kaimyo, right? Uh, people get posthumous titles and ranks through the ordination that they undergo uh, in the course of the, uh, of the funerals. There is also the canonization, the granting of a title and the right to receive uh, sacrifices, which can be given by the state or by the Taoist, or both. Uh, but there, there are also ways of uh, ensuring one's divinization during one's own lifetime. Right? And that's not divinization by others, like family or friends or local community. It's self-divinization. Either through direct access to transcendence, immortality pra practices, or uh, um, pure land devotional practices, or obtaining uh, a divine rank, either through ordination or uh, self-promotion through spirit writing. And I'm going to show a couple of slides about these two uh, ways of access to uh, divine ranks. So ordination, I've, I've discussed this for the earlier prayers, right? The, the receiving of a loop ordination register. Uh, this continues to be the case. This is famous scrolls that um, represent the ordination of a Ming empress. So of course, the, uh, it's uh, uh, not representative of popular practices, right? Uh, and uh, the kind of very beautiful uh, painting on silk that describe how the, uh, this lady, uh, the, the empress, is taken in audience to the gods uh, and rece receives a very high-ranking title in the divine bureaucracy. Um, does not represent popular practices, but actually uh, ordination like this and receiving a title and a rank during one's lifetime was quite common for those people who could afford it. And uh, all the way, it's still in the 20th century, we find rich merchants, businessmen, uh, intellectuals who um, pay for the, uh, and, and actually it was quite expensive, not because they had to pay the priest, but because they had to pay, the, uh, uh, for, uh, to pay for the uh, making of all the documents and the, uh, the, the rituals that, uh, in the course of which they received those documents. So that was quite common. Many scholars received uh, um, ordination of the Wenchong Lu that gave them a rank and a title in the ordination of Wenchong, right? The, the god Wenchong was managing the world of the, uh, the officials and the scholars. That was very common. Uh, the other way is spirit writing. So that's a bad photograph of uh, I took in a Hong Kong uh, spirit writing uh, apartment shrine uh, a few uh, years ago. And of course, that's interesting because, of course, we see that the, the, the medium, right, which passes by the god and, and writing uh, through this implement in a tray of uh, ash uh, is a lady. And so is the uh, uh, person uh, writing the, uh, the revealed words uh, sitting next to her because spirit writing was a way for women to access the ranks of the divine uh, bureaucracy. Uh, of course, they, they could also access it through uh, posthumous uh, ordination. And one, it's not the only purpose of spirit writing, which serves many different functions, but one of them, uh, and that's clearly shown by many uh, anthropological um, uh, research done on spirit writing in contemporary Chinese societies that show that one of the motifs of the people taking part in the spirit writing groups was to ensure that they would get promoted among the gods. And indeed, in many, and there's a whole variety of spirit writing groups, but in almost all of them, uh, the groups uh, canonize, divinize their dead members who very frequently appear and give revelation just after they have died, right? And so ensure they are fellows who have been left behind that they are you know, now in charge of the Ministry of uh, Educating Justice in the Sixth Bureau, Second Branch, uh, Left Division, of, you know, and so on and so forth. Because you know, these groups keep inventing new bureaus and administrations. So the, the divine bureaucracy is really, it 
expanding non-stop because we have to accommodate all those, all those people and all these groups have uh, a clear sense of their you know, innovating uh, by inventing new names and titles. And here, that's uh, a, a gazetteer published by one spirit writing groups in, in Zhejiang in the 30s. And one uh, the largest part of the gazetteer well, they give their text, they give their history, and so on and so forth. But they also give the portraits and the ordination titles of all their dead members. And that includes women. And these were not, I mean, of course, most literati and officials took part in spirit writing. But that's included everybody who could read and write. And these are really like rich peasant families who had their uh, women folk participate in those spirit writing and becoming gods, uh, thanks to that. Um, time is flying fast, but I have one last important point to make, uh, which is that by the song, we also see one more development to those uh, procedures for turning dead people into gods, and that's giving access to those who have no education, because ordination tended to be restricted. I mean, universal ordination, it was done in the early Taoism as more or less seized by that time. So ordination is a bit expensive. Spirit writing uh, requires that you can read and write, so it's not open to everybody. Um, and the idea that you could become a, a city god or earth god was in theory open to everybody, but in practice, people considered that this was a normal destiny for scholars, right? people who had training. So the question remained, how do you become a god if you're just a peasant or a soldier? Well, we have one very early song text, which is fascinating for many reasons, the Yixing Bao de Juan, that is, to my knowledge, provides to my knowledge one of the earliest uh, mentions of the solution that was found to that problem. The Yixing Bao de Juan is the history of one god called the Black Killer, Hei Sha, was uh, um, adopted as the protector by the Song Dynasty uh, through a, a very successful and entrepreneurial spirit medium called the uh, Zhang Shouzhen. And the history of that spirit medium and that god uh, was uh, written down by Wang Qingzhuo, who was uh, the, one of the highest ranking ministers of uh, Emperor Song Zhenzong. So again, if you think elite culture, imperial courts, nothing to do with local mediums, wrong. <laughs> very fascinating, the, uh, the story. Um, and that's the only full text we have by uh, Wang Qingzhuo, which is very well known in some political and intellectual history. Um, so to, to cut a, a long story short, because the uh, issue about the Joan is pretty long, we have one story uh, about, um, so I'm not going to read and translate all that, but it's, basically, it's, it's an old soldier who becomes a devotee at the, at the temple of this uh, god, the black killer. And he comes to uh, see the god and he says, look, uh, I've not had an education. I don't know how to read and write. I've just been a soldier. But um, I'm pretty worried about what I will become of me after I die. Right? So after I die, I would like to become one of your assistants. And I can help you, uh, Wan Zhu, right, it's just a foot soldier, to help you with in your exorcistic work. So please take me on. And the gods, Jiang Yan, through the spirit medium, said, yes, OK, I will take you on. And so the guy dies immediately, right? <laughs> like, no long agony or nothing. He just dies on the spot. And he appears to the spirit mediums out of the blue. And he said, OK, now you can add a statue of me in your temple. I am the Zhang Jun, the general with the, uh, the iron wheel. So the idea is that even if you have no education, you can become a low ranking god, but again with the promise that you can work your way up by being adopted as a god at 
uh, I mean, at the, at the service of this God. And this, by the modern times, has become a very widespread, and I think very important and underestimated way the Chinese had to deal with their uh, anxiety about dying and their posthumous destiny, is that giving themselves to the God, to entrusting themselves in the service of the God and being thereby uh, ensure that they will continue to serve the God after they die, and so they won't go to hell and be tortured. Right, so it's ordinary people be becoming divine clerics. Here, um, we have a, a document. My colleague, Feng Ling, is uh, working on a, a major temples in, in the suburbs of Hangzhou called the Lao Dongyue. It's one of the eastern peak temples in, in Hangzhou that used to have hundreds, literally hundreds, of association of devotees covering the whole, not just this part of Hangzhou, but the whole region, that all had given themselves to the service of the god. And they were coming, they pledged to come each time there was a, a festival or ritual in the temple and work for the god. So they worked as clerics, as ushers, servants, cleaners, you name it. And when they give themselves, like Shushen, and of course this is, and I'm not still very clear about that, I'm, I'm working on it, but I think this is in direct continuation to the earlier medieval practice in, in, in Buddhism, that people gave themselves to the Buddha, so they, they become full <coughs> right, slave of the Buddha, or to a monastery, or a monk, or a deity. Lots of people were called Guanin Nu, right, the slave of Guanin, because they have given themselves, that Shushen, to Guanin, and so as to ensure their salvation. Because in, if you are in the service of the Buddha or Guanin, of course you are not going to be dragged to hell, right? And so this, this can't, certainly continues to be practiced, but there is a, a Taoist twist to that, that you, you enter the service of a god, as Kirk or soldier, servant, whatever, and you obtain a certificate. And that's a, a copy of a <coughs> certificate that was issued by this temple in, in Hangzhou, um, in the 1930s, but th this temple is still operating today. No official recognition, but it's huge. Um, and so we see that's, uh, of course, the, uh, an image from the Dian Shen Zhai Huabao, so late uh, Qing representation of those uh, bureaucratic staging in the temples. And very clear, clearly, of those people who are dressed as clerks and runners of the gods, and very often the god themselves was played by a major, uh, uh, like a elder member of those uh, devotional association, they play the ritual, but it's not a play. They are real, because they, they are in the service of the God, and they do the work of the God. And we have stories that tell about, you know, old Zhang or Li the Second, who used to work in the, the temple of the Changfeng or, or Dongyue <laughs> as a clerk, or, uh, and who, after as he dies, appears, he's seen in the temple still doing that work, doing paperwork for the God. Because you know, he says, I'm, I'm still there, and I'm, you know, I have a position, I have a living, I'm saved. So uh, coming to my conclusion, we have over this very long uh, uh, sweeping uh, historical overview, what I see as an expansion of the possibilities for people to become gods. From uh, a prospect that was reserved for aristocrats in early times, uh, to Taoist initiates in the in the Tian Shu Dao during the uh, uh, second, third century of the Common Era, to by the Song, pretty much everybody, including ordinary people who could just give themselves to the God and acquire, of course, a very low ranking. But based on the idea that you can work your way up, they had this promise of eventually becoming a, a full-fledged, respectable God, and even possibly. A, a, have a temple and, and receive sacrifices. So we have a continuous expansion of divine bureaucracy. And that's my last slide, where I would just want to briefly go back to this question which I mentioned at the uh, beginning of the talk, <coughs> when I said that Myron Cowen opposed the idea of salvation and transcendence on the one hand, and just, just being a god. And of course, at first sight, it might seem that these two terms, bureaucracy and salvation, refer to two very different things, right? Transcendence, absolute certainty of never, uh, of being, uh, staying forever uh, in, a, in a state of bliss on the one hand, 
and on the other, of course, enjoying the privileges of being a god, but not being ensured that will will last forever. Yet, I consider that all the practices that we have just seen, like people giving themselves <coughs> to the gods so as to uh, uh, acquire a status, even a, a low rank, ranking status, is based on the idea that if you respect the code and the code is known, uh, it's not arbitrary, the promotion is open. It's a kind of a tenure track. <laughs> yeah. Divinization. Yeah. Golf club, yeah as it were, and if, I mean, both text and fieldwork show us that for many members of religious communities, transcendence, be it immortality or uh, uh, rebirth in the pure land, is of course an ideal, but it's considered very difficult to obtain in one's lifetime. So first, getting a status as a god has, has become the major access pass to transcendence. Because the, you can, as uh, I mentioned earlier, and that's been stated early on by the Taoists, when they say that the, uh, the worlds of the immortals and the worlds of the uh, uh, neither world's bureaucracy uh, are not separated, are not entirely separated. You can work your way from the from uh, your way up, from becoming a lowly clerk to eventually reaching the status of immortality of becoming a Xian Guan. Right? And moreover, both the uh, the transcendence, the, the Xian or the Fu, and the gods, the Shen, are cooperating. They are actors in the shared plans for the salvation of humanity, and that's uh, uh, very obvious in all the uh, um, eschatological texts that flourish during the late imperial period and, and, and down to the present day. Uh, so for this reason, I propose that we don't oppose bureaucracy and salvation, but that we see the project, the state building project of including everybody in the bureaucracy, even if as lowly clerks or runners or servants, gives everybody a hope, a promise to eventually access salvation through the long road. And with that promise, I'll wrap up my presentation. So thank you for your attention. Do we? For the recording. On? Yes, it's on. Okay, so um, so my question is about this first, um, the first group, bad death, suicide, and self-sacrifice. Mm. So I assume here you were using suicide in a negative sense, right? Not not heroic suicide, you know, because mm. there's many kinds of suicide, right? If that's true, and yet, so I'm a little confused about this category because. Self-sacrifice looks like a positive death. Suicide could be positive or negative, and mm -hmm. bad death obviously is bad. Uh, so could you talk about that a little bit? And also, that's the first part of the question. The second part is, if these are all in some sense unnatural deaths or unpreferred deaths or unexpected deaths, that would also imply that um, if you have a normal death, that you don't have access to becoming a god, at least through this system. Mm -hmm. So that, those things are. Um, when we look at actual local cults, we find a great number of um, those uh, gods who have committed suicide, and it's not always rightful suicide. In some cases it might be, in some cases not. Clearly there are some cases like 
the story of Jiang Zouan, where the god is uh, extremely powerful, very lean, because he's vengeful. So he has this huge built-up uh, resentment that keeps him or her going, and it makes him very powerful. And, uh, and so people worship that spirit for that reason. Now, there is this uh, continuous attempt at uh, beautifying the gods that's going on. And so that's why in the, uh, in the Yuli Baocha, the text, I, uh, the early 19th century text I uh, mentioned early in the, in the talk, they, they do discuss that and they say um, very explicitly, um, those who have committed rightful suicide and they give a list of the, uh, what, what, counts, what counts for uh, rightful suicides, like uh, a, a woman who has pro uh, protected her chastity, or um, a soldier or a general who has uh, you know, decided not to surrender but to fight to death in face of uh, overwhelming enemies and, and so on and so forth. Those can become gods, but those who commit suicide just out of you know, spite or to get other people into trouble or you know, for that kind of reason cannot become gods. That's what the Yuli Bao Chao says, but if that text says that, it's Precisely because those kind of people also sometimes become gods, because they are considered very powerful, right? Even though they are less moral. <laughs> and that would be bad death, then, right? Yes, yes, of course, of course. So then the, the distinction between bad death and good death seems to be not so clear, right? I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, did I, did I answer? Well, yeah, I guess so. So it seems mm -hmm. that what we're getting to here then is the, cat the, the categorization of people who are able to become gods then mm -hmm. is being opened up. Yeah. And they want to promote around them. On the mm -hmm. other hand, they want universal access. Yeah. And so that eventually then who's in that category becomes almost meaningless, right? Because they're yeah. all... Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know, yeah. I if I could just follow up on Sorry. that yeah. question, it, it makes me wonder to what... Um, it makes me wonder to what extent um, th there's a clear distinction between gods and, say, demons or kind of potentially vengeful ghosts and mm. um, those sorts of entities, if you can call them en entities. Yeah. It, all kinds of actors in Chinese society through time work at making these distinctions, and, and, uh, and uh, all those distinctions are different because they, are they have different motivations, they have different purposes, they have different perspectives. So, uh, yeah. In some cases, well, a cult is, a local cult is to a demon and up to the point when it is recognized and given a title by the state or by the Taoists, or sometimes the Buddhists, even though the Buddhists have more or less uh, stopped doing this uh, in the modern period. It, it certainly did that earlier on. Um, so it's of, of course, these categories are not clear cut. The question is whether they are recognized and given a, a title or not. Thank you. So the, a title given by someone might not be recognized by an, uh, someone else. So is, there is not one unified system where everybody agrees on who is God, who is a demon. Right. Thank, thanks very much. Different actors worked at mostly recycling demons into gods. So ex expanding the, uh, because you better have those spirits you know, in, in your system, under your control, than out. So the state is re recycling demons into gods. The Buddhists are doing this as well. The Taoists are doing this as well. The spirit mediums are doing this all the time. So the categories are actually very fluid in um, kind of depends on... Yeah, they, they, they don't have uh, an absolute reference. Right. Yeah. There's someone behind you as well, and, it's and you, related. And, and Thomas. I mean, now you've and already you. talked about that for a little while, but specifically in the context of the song, right? Because uh, uh, I think that's when you said the demons were especially separated mm. from the gods. And, and you were talking about categories like territory 
and uh, the judicial, right? So I, uh, I was wondering, for instance, if the demons had committed any certain kinds of crimes and if the demons, like the gods, were associated with territory at that time, maybe. Well, many of the gods, when they are given a title and a function, they are also given a territorial jurisdiction. Not all of them, but most of them. Right, demons don't have a territory because they don't have the right to have a territory, right? They have not been given anything. They might say things, but it's not rightfully theirs. Uh, I'm not sure this really answers the question, but um, yeah, the idea of having a territory is part of this uh, canonization process. Mm -hmm. Not that they were invested with ownership of it, hmm. but they were that whether or not they were somehow local. Oh yeah, yeah. sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so, kind of building on that, um, and I know on this slide, in fact, it's where you, you were talking about how during the song, the uh, there was a, uh, officials started rewriting yeah. the stories of local cults um, mm. to conform to this yeah. uh, wider expectation of, of what a god should have done to become a god. Mm. Um, so I'm assuming that with uh, sort of a top-down imposition of this, uh, this sort of interpretation, um, so this, this type of process of rewriting, that um, local people didn't just accept that uh, right away and um, discard previous interpretations of the cult. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm wondering if in song sources you see indications on the part of officials who are writing these sources um, of continued practice in, and uh, con continued um, uh, lo local people continuing to interpret these cults on their own terms and um, continuing, you know, practices that have a distinct local flavor. And and if so, how do they talk about it? How do they express the sort of unorthodoxness of those um, practices? Yeah, th there's a whole literature. Uh, on, on this particular topic that's uh, linked to debates about um, you know, standardization of Chinese culture and elite culture versus popular culture with a number of important scholars who have written about this. Um, and and, and m many of those studies, most of those studies show that, of course, the local understanding went on. Very famous case is the Wutong, the Five Powers, uh, they are, have been countless. It's, it's a major spirit medium cult. It appears by the song, if not earlier, and it's still all over the place. It's, it's been repressed nonstop since the song. And in Jiangnan, to do some field work in Jiangnan, it's, all, it's the, one of the most flourishing cults. Actually, repression do them good, you know? You know. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, in, in the center of Suzhou, in a park, you have spirit like tens and tens of spirit mediums active every day, day in, day out. Fascinating. So, um, yeah, the look, and, 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 and so the, uh, for the Wutong, the official explained, no, they are not those uh, one-legged goblins. They are actually five brothers who all studied, and, you know, yeah. and, and, and the Taoists did the same, and this has been going on for 1,000 years. And for local people, they are still one-legged goblins, but they are very efficacious. So they are, they are little shrines in their houses all over the place in Jiangnan. So local interpretation continues. But my take on, on the, was not to revisit again these stories of you know, elite and popular and resistance and, and, and uh, reverberation. My take on this was to see why the officials were rewriting the stories of the gods. And they were not just because they were elite and they were you know, disliking the local cults. There, there was some of that, certainly, but it's also because they were thinking of their own ways to become gods. And I think that adds a very interesting new perspective on the whole issue, because it's not just about you know, very macro level sort of uh, the elite <laughs> and the people. It's about individuals who think about what it is to become a god and who have an own personal stake on this, and I'm just not you know, playing out class values. So th that was my uh, attempt to inject something new into that debate. But it's, it's been a long and, and major debate in, in the field of uh, Chinese uh, history and culture. 
Um, yeah, I think uh, Thomas wanted to ask a question, and Lionel as well, and, 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 and you. Thank you. Sorry, I'm... I, I see the floor. I can ask you later. Oh, okay. I have actually three interrelated questions. They're all part of the same uh, section of your talk, where you, which was actually profoundly rich and, um, and very rewarding to be a part of and participate in. But the second revolution in Song, right? You, yeah. you, you raised the issue of uh, this Yan Gong, the idea of these um, recognitions of merit and so forth. And I'm wondering, uh, this strikes me as something which is clearly related to the Jing Tu practice of essentially seeking merit and good karma and this sort of thing. So I was interested to think about the links between, let's say, what would I identify as Tian Shi Dao practice and what might also be seen as a, a popular practice found in Jing Tu in which mm. people gain merit for the pure land by engaging in good mm. karma, for example. And then it has a lineage that goes all the way back, all the way up to the Ming with these ledgers of demerit and so forth that people who then call themselves Ru are doing in the 16th and 17th centuries. Mm. But there was that. Then the second issue was that of, um, you talked about how people were, were essentially appealing for promotion within this world of bureaucracy beyond the living, all right? And it wasn't clear to me who they were, who they were actually trying to seek promotion from. Was it Tian, was it Zhang Daoling, or who actually is the authority they're seeking out here to essentially be recognized for their merit and be given promotion? That was unclear to me. Hmm. And then lastly, I didn't understand um, whether or not the Lu, these registers that you're talking about, are something which can take both wooden and paper form, and if they are taking wooden form, is it in the form of a tally that can be broken so that there can be a half in one place and a half elsewhere? Or would there be a paper form which you would actually burn the paper form at some point and also keep a wooden form? I mean, I'm wondering about how that phenomenologically would work, so, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the Yangon, Right. Uh, of course, it's related to the, the l even larger conception of gong as something that you can count, that's measurable, right? And that you find, of course, in the gong go ge, but that goes all the way early to uh, uh, um, the bao pu ge hong, uh, third century. Right. Uh, you can actually count them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and of course, also in Buddhism, the, the idea of accumulating merit. Um, so the, the yang gong is part of that, but it has a very specific effect, is that it's it's done in order to immediately promote people. It's, it's not accumulating, like storing merit for the next life. Or for, it's telling to your superior, um, okay, I've done this. No, I need to be promoted from rank uh, 6B to 6A now. And that's, that's what they do. And all those geographies, they just have long lists of administrative titles. Of He's been promoted to second assistant director of the Bureau of uh, uh, Retribution, uh, to a senior assistant uh, compiler in the Bureau of, you know. So that, that's the idea, really, promotion. But of course, it's also based on, on, on counting, because all these, uh, this, this, this long list of titles and ranks are on the grid, you know, like. And and uh, by the songs, by the song period, it becomes the uh, nine rank the uh, uh ranking grid, which is also used in the civil bureaucracy. Who's promoting? Um, good question. In the early Tian Shi Dao, it's not ver so very clear to me. I I need to uh, look further into the question. By the song, it's it's Yu Huang. It's the Jade Emperor. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, the Lu is on paper. Uh, is there is also uh, ordination procedures include an, an awful lot of uh, uh, documents, and there are also of course tallies, and you keep one and you burn the other one, that kind of things, and there are contracts. Um, there are many documents, but the loo itself is on paper and it's rolled in a box, and you're supposed to carry the box on your um, belt, and, and so it's called pay loo. You're supposed to pay to keep it okay. with you all the time. And of course, if something happens to it, like it falls on the ground or you lose it, and that, that has very dire consequences for you. And that's one of the reasons why, actually, m most of the time when you receive a loo, quickly afterwards, you burn it. it you store it in the right. other world. That's safer. I thought so. Yeah. Yes. And then Raul. <coughs> 
you mentioned spirit mediums. Could you describe the experience and process of interaction which at least some people have with this world of the gods, how they see it, how they perceive it, how it speaks to them? Oh, that's a vast question. Um, there are all kinds of communications. And uh, of course, spirit writing, I was mentioning spirit writing because that's the major way for um, you know, getting uh, access to uh, the divine bureaucracy is a very controlled form of uh, spirit possession. So it's, very, it's not spectacular. Uh, there is no um, like spectacular body oh, movement. So Hmm? Is there a trance state? I'm not entirely sure about the uh, scientific status of that word trance. I'm, I'm a little bit worried about this. Um, there are rituals for be becoming possessed. I, there is a procedure. It's very controlled. It, it's quite um, uh, standardized. Well, not exactly standardized, but it's uh, the, the the spirit writing is trying to do it all the time, right? So it's 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 very routine, right? And it's not spectacular. So they, are, they have these little movements, and and so they are in opposition to the uh, spirit mediums who talk, who do not write. It's the basic opposition is writing versus talking, and some spirit mediums who are also possessed by the gods but who talk are by contrast very spectacular. Some do. Uh, self fortification some would talk with the voice of the person who was possessing them, which might be quite spectacular if it's someone recently passed away so that everybody knows, so they would recognize, hear her voice, um, and she would, uh, if uh, uh, like possessed by a god like Jigong who likes to drink, then the spirit mediums would suddenly gulp down gallons of beer or, you know, spirits. So this is a very different kind of contact with the gods. Spirit writing is very controlled. Okay, now all the aspects to that question, but I, okay, I'll, I'll keep to spirit writing. I mean, you don't yeah. have to close your eyes and all of a sudden you're in the world of the, uh, of the gods when you're mm. walking around and talking to people and mm. interacting with them. You go to a, a trance state or something like that and you suddenly become part of their world instead of part of your own world. Mm. Yeah, both kinds of mediums. Mediums who talk and mediums who write are extremely common. So it's, it's a very an everyday experience in most Chinese communities. Raul? Thanks. I'll try to be, but this doesn't give me any help. <laughs> <laughs> I try to be brief uh, for this very totalizing lecture. And so because it's totalizing, I'm interested in counter narratives. Uh, in listening to what you said, of course, I kept thinking about Buddhist materials. And yes, of course, in the Chinese Buddhist world, there's a lot of engagement with the, the enchanted land that you describe. Uh, and there's also disengagement from it that's very deliberate. Uh, at a later time, we can talk about these certificates because Buddhists have certificates that serve similar purposes to things that you're talking about. But so my curiosity is knowing that some Buddhists in history and in the present in China say, yeah, this world kind of exists, but we don't care. Let's be safe in this world, but it's useless, this kind of notion. So they're opting out. Are there other opt-out narratives that you've looked at? Actually, I have a very similar question about retired celestial officials. <laughs> <laughs> you could be an ancestor for five generations until they forget about you, mm -hmm. and then you go away. Does something similar happen with, with officialdom? Mm -hmm. do, you, do you stay an official and then essentially go to the pure land? Um, okay. Um, of course, there are counter narratives, but 
I hope I didn't convey the sense that that was what all Chinese people have been doing since the, uh, the, the Han or antiquity or the Song or whatever. Um, my point is that it's more common than we thought that people try to become gods and there were various ways to do that and it was both quite rather common in practice and recognized, socially accepted. But of course, not everybody had to engage in that because that was optional in the sense that it's a question of individual, com individual commitment. So by contrast to the uh, family and local community's treatment of their dead, which does encompass everybody, um, practices towards divinization is a question of one's individual's interest. And some people had very little interest, so did not, did not engage in any of that. So there is the, uh, the uh, negative narrative of just lack of interest. Like you said, among some Buddhists, but not only Buddhists, but yeah, some people said, yeah, well, we don't know, what's the point? There is also, and that's, I think that's just as interesting the, um, the perspective of um, scholars and officials, literati, who are not very religious, not very interesting in these things, but we did not reject them like, you know, atheist or whatever. Um, there's one very interesting case, you, you, I, I, this made towering scholar who compiled four different versions of his complete rules during his own lifetime. Yue died in 1908, I think. Um, very interesting guy, major classicist scholar, but also wrote all, I mean, uh, martial art novels and uh, BG talking about, you know, the, 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 the supernatural. And Yue talks about those stories and he says, <coughs> you know, I'm less religious than most people around me. Um, I may become a god when I die because that's, I mean, uh, you know, passively, because that's apparently god, everybody does, maybe. Uh, but then he, he, told, he tells stories about his brother becoming a god, uh, his, his disciple talking about their fathers and their, their masters becoming gods and, and going to temples and talking with them, you know, the whole thing. And he describes that in a kind of a, well, not ethnographic, but distance kind of way, saying, yeah, that, that's what they think, that's what they do. And, uh, and maybe that will happen to me as well. Who knows? Like I care. <laughs> um, so you also have that kind of uh, disengagement, but which is interesting because it shows how socially normal at that time, that's the very last decades of the Qing, these ideas were. They were not prescriptive, but they were very common. Um, yeah, As I'll, I'll be very interested in the Buddhist uh, certificates. Yeah, um, retired celestial officials. I've not thought of that. Brilliant. Um, at, at what point do you uh, lose individuation, or, or is that you know? Well, m of course, if if we. T most of my, my presentation was very much taking the, the point of view of the individuals engaging in those practices, right? Why it's interesting to become a god? Well, the, the, the question, when you put it like this, sounds a little bit nonsensical. It, it does seem an interesting perspective to become a god, right? But, well, it seems to me. But um, we are, my descriptions take their perspective. Why they would be interested in those things? Right? Now, from their perspective, there is this promise, you know, never-ending promotion, getting higher and higher title and more and more exalted and, and, and so on and so forth. But of course, when you step back and you look at what happens, 99.99% of those people are very quickly forgotten and nobody worships them anymore because, you know, you, you can't worship all the people who have died since the beginning of humanity, right? This is just a bit too much. So, of course, they get... Uh, they are not retired, they just get completely f forgotten. But that, I've not Promoting seen, yeah, but I've not seen that 
come up as a concern or as a cause for anxiety in the writing, so far, in the writing of people who would talk about their divinization. One of the things I didn't understand was that some people had a sheng tzu, and it seemed to me, I, I don't even know whether I'm translating it correctly, that that means while alive, a tzutang was raised to them, and then they had cult. Is, is that the right understanding of this term? Yes. Uh, there is a nice article on, on sheng tzu by, um, yes, yes, thank you. Yeah. Sarah, somebody. Okay, good. Um, it, the, the idea of Shang Tzu seems a little bit bizarre when, when you first think of it. Uh, I suggested to, sorry, she could translate it by a shrine to somebody who happened not to have died yet. But um, recently I came across cases in, uh, in Taoist geographies uh, that seems to me to uh, reflect on the case of Shang Tzu and, and to help us make sense of them. There is this nice uh, geography of Marshall Wen, which is the, the, uh, the, the prototypical case of this, this soldier, uneducated, very you know, brave and, and, and well, soldier, who becomes a major god in the, uh, the pantheons of the exorcistic movements of the song. And, um, and so he's in the army, and uh, is, uh, is uh, the general of, his, uh, of the army where he's serving, uh, distrusts him and wants to kill him, so he escaped and he becomes a vagabond and he even becomes a, a butcher of oxen, which is the worst thing you can do. And the gods come to him and say, um, how, how can you break the heavenly rules so brazenly? Try to think about your salvation. And he said, but I, he said, yeah, but I, I don't have the xiang wheel. I don't have the capacity to become an immortal as yet. He said, and the god says, uh, the god is the, the son of the Eastern Peak uh, Emperor. He said, of course not. You're not going to become an immortal. Clearly not. You're not you don't have the, uh, you know, what it takes to become an immortal. But you can enter into the service of the uh, Eastern Peak administration, and then you will become someone. So he enters the temple. He becomes a medium for the temple. He works for the temple. And then the gods comes back and say, okay, you have done good work. No, we have ensured you are guaranteed to have, uh, when you die, to become a Tai Bao, which both mean a, a, a military officer and a spirit medium uh, in the administration of the Eastern Peak. So you have now the guarantee of your position in the, uh, in the, bureauc in the divine bureaucracy when you die. And the next sentence is, so you can now build a statue of yourself and put it in the temple. And he does that. So he, he makes a statue of himself and he puts a statue in the, uh, among the uh, many uh, assistants and, and, and lower uh, ranking gods uh, in the uh, Eastern Peak administration. So he puts a statue of himself in the temple while he's still alive. And then the story goes on. But yeah. there's that. So it, it makes sense. If, you're, if you know that you are going to be a god, you might just as well stop being worshipped now. Why wait? <laughs> <laughs> the earliest words of Zuda. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much.